Um, our guest speaker tonight is a really special pastor and leader. Um, he planted a church over 30 years ago in Chicago that grew to over 15,000 people in regular weekly attendance. And this church planted churches all around America. And uh, the average attendance on a weekend of all the churches they planted uh, included was over 85,000 people. Uh, his teaching ministry, his Bible teaching, was one of the most uh, disseminated Bible teachings on the radio across America. Uh, his teaching was widely disseminated on Christian television. Uh, when I was first coming into ministry, I would listen to him preach and just learn from him how to teach the Bible. In fact, he wrote the book that I gave out to some of you before church or before this gathering here tonight. Uh, his name is James McDonald, and uh, he is an awesome <laughs> pastor and preacher. So. This is just, I got to give you a little bit of the background of this. This is nuts. Um, I was preaching a few weeks ago in this all-in series, and after the 9 o'clock service, I went backstage, and a friend who uh, is a pastor in Iowa texts me, and he goes, bro, James McDonald's at your church. And I was like, what? And I, I look, and I go up on his Instagram, and he had posted a picture out in front of our building, and just, you know, said he was at Generation Church today, and he had a great time. And I'm like, what is going on right now? Okay, you got to understand what this is like for me. This is like if you're the high school quarterback and then you found out Brett Favre was at your football game. You're like, what? So I, I reached out to him and then he was just so encouraging and gracious to me, uh, encouraging in ways, just, I mean, blowing my mind and just offering to help. And I'm like, yes, I want your help. I need your help. Uh, and so in the last uh, several weeks, we've been meeting regularly, getting to know him and his wife, Kathy, and they have gone from being long distance mentors who were helping me in ministry for many years, but I didn't know them, to being close distance friends and a mentor who I learned from and I'm thankful for. Man, he is just a godly man, a great example of what it looks like to live for Jesus and make disciples. I'm thankful that he uh, has been able to pour into me and has been able to encourage me. <laughs> Last Sunday I was preaching and after the first service he texted me and just gave me like a little good idea, some way I could like tweak my sermon and make it. And he, as soon as I got it, I was like, that's genius. And then I was able to use it for the rest of the day. And it's just so powerful. Uh, so I heard T.D. Jake said this. He said, you can tell the size of the project God is building by the significance of the equipment he assembles. And it gives me a lot of confidence to know that God is doing something very special here uh, when I see him bring people like Pastor James to be a blessing, to be a mentor, and to help me. So I'm going to ask you to do this. We need to give a welcome that is sufficient and appropriate considering that there are very few people alive right now who have made as big of an impact in the kingdom of God as James McDonald. So will you stand to your feet and help me welcome Pastor James. Okay, come on, come on. Great, now you're taking up my time, y'all. They started that clock when you were still clapping. I want those seconds back. I'm grateful to be here. I think my heart and all this is going to come out as we go through it. So let me just say that I love uh, Pastor Ryan and his wife, Amy, and I got invited to this church by which we went to live in this park over here with our RV because our, our son moved here. It's a long and and painful story, but um, I could just tell you, I wasn't interested in going to church anywhere, and this lady that we're playing pickleball with, a superstar senior, moved to play pickleball, and, and, and this lady says to us, hey, would you ever be interested in going to church? And I was like, hell no. I never told her nothing about us, nothing. We said, okay, fine, we'll come. And wouldn't you know, I'd go to a church where the man preaches the word of God. Yeah. 
how rare it is and how great is the cost. You have no idea. And how blessed you are. So get your Bibles and go to First uh, Peter chapter 2. I'm going to preach a little message here that, uh, to men. And I promise you, you've never heard a message on this subject ever. I promise you, you have never heard a message on this subject. I promise you, you never have. So there's this little guy. And he was looking for a job, and he couldn't find a job, so he got into the want ads. You know what they used to have in the newspaper? And he's looking, looking, looking for a job. He can't find anything, so he says, I'm going to take that job. There's a guy here that wants a bodyguard. So he calls the guy on the phone. He's like, I think I'd like to be your bodyguard. He says, well, how big a boy are you? An important question to ask if the guy's a bodyguard, right? He says, well, you know, I'm buck 40. You know, um, you know, five seven maybe. The guy's like, you can't take care of me. You're not big enough to take care of me. He says, no, no, I can't. The guy hangs up on him. He says, that's no way. He goes over to his house. He knocks on the door. He says, you're the guy, aren't you? He says, yeah, I am. I can take care of you. I'm going to be your bodyguard. He says, no, you're not tough enough to take care of me. He says, I'm tough. He says, well, how, how tough are you? He says, well, let me tell you. One time I was out working on the farm. I got some hay stuck in the back of the combine, got off the tractor, went around the back, pulling the hay out of the combine, tore my arm right off, picked up my arm, went in the house, sewed my arm back on, went back out, finished the job. The guy said, you really do that? He said, I really did. He said, are you really that tough? He said, I really am. Then he said, then you got the job. And the guy says, right on. <laughs> now, that is... The response that I get from men when I ask them, as I have many times, what is God's number one provision for your success as a man? Uh, the Holy Bible, Jesus Right, okay, so when we get past God himself as the provision, Jesus is the word of God, I have all that, amen, the Bible, God's word, amen, the Holy Spirit, amen, say amen. amen. Okay, setting that aside, humanly speaking, I had that word in the sentence, what is God, humanly speaking, what is God's number one provision for your success as a man? It's my wife. No, it is not your wife. It's my job. No, it is not your job. It's my church. Sort of, you're getting warmer. <laughs> First Peter chapter 2, verse 17. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. That's four imperatives. I'm going to build the whole message on the second one. We're going to call this 1 Peter 2, 17b. Get it? A, B, C, D. Are you tracking with me? If you are, go like this. I'm going fast. I only got so much time. A, B, C, D. I'm on B. The words are three. Love the brotherhood. Say it. Love no, but say it like you're a man. Say it. Every time I say 1 Peter 2, 17b in this sermon, you say. Love All right. And here's why. Number one, brotherhood matters. Man. Somebody needs to tell the Bible translators to stop screwing up 1 Peter 2, 17b. Because a lot of translations say crazy stuff. Okay, I'm listening. What do you got in your Bible if it isn't that? Love the... Eh, love the family of God. No, here, here's a little, just a little side teaching. We have a little theology. If someone say, come on, theology... We believe in verbal inspiration. Verbal inspiration. You know what verbal inspiration means? Pastor, do we believe in verbal inspiration? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. That means that God chose the words, y'all. He, he, wasn't, he wasn't looking over the apostle's shoulder going, yeah, write, write some more stuff about temptation. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, more like that. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's not how it happened. Okay, First Peter, Second uh, Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says that all Scripture is God-breathed. It came out of the mouth of God. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21 says that holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And I'm just a little fed up, just a little fed up with people jerking around the Bible. Okay, I don't need it easier to read. I don't need it easier to understand. I need to know what God 
said. Now, God said, and I don't, I'm not a translation guy. I'm not pitching for one or the other. They all got their problems. I'm just saying, translate it, man. Translate it. And here it is. Your time's coming, bro. Just, I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate your eagerness. Your time's coming just in just a moment. In fact, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, B says, God chose three words. Tain, Adelphonteta, Agapete. Now, I don't need you to know Greek, but I need you to know that I do. <laughs> because... There's just three words. The brotherhood love. The brotherhood love. This is a command. This is a command. This isn't a try. This isn't a when I get around to it. This is a God of the universe who spoke and the worlds were formed. That one says the brotherhood love. That. Now, you see, so I'm supposed to love the brothers. No, that is not what it says. There are scriptures that say, let brotherly love continue, love your brother as yourself. That's in the Bible. But this is not talking about individual brother loving. Not at all. This verse, it's not about all Christians. It's not about women. There's no women in this phrase. This is about men. This is a verse about Christian men. This is about what we are, a brotherhood, and what we have, a brotherhood. I confessed, I confessed to um, liking, to uh, really liking gangster movies. Don't leave me up here. A bunch of liars down front here. Any, anyone else here like, like, like The Godfather? That's quite a movie, man. And I mean, I could go on and on. Untouchables, that The Irishman. I mean, more recently, good movies, right? You with me? Now, I know what they're doing is wrong. Even, even sometimes deplorable. But I confess to being jealous <laughs> of their brotherhood. They got a thing. Everyone understands it. Everyone's on the program. Now the threat of death helps. <laughs> In Italian, it's la cosa nostra, which actually translated means our thing. Our thing. Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, we have a thing. We have a thing, y'all. It's our thing. It's called the brotherhood. And the word of God commands us to love it. In fact, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17b says, I love a true story, and uh, one story I'm particularly fond of comes out of the Second World War. It's the story of uh, two men who um, enlisted together and uh, went to boot camp together, shipped out together, fought side by side in the trenches in a way that only a man who's been through a war would understand, where every single day you don't know if this is your last day. And under a particularly withering attack, these two brothers fighting side by side. Now, one of them was wounded while they were in retreat. The other arrived back in the trench to notice that his brother was not there. He started to run out of the trench to go get him, but the enemy fire was so significant, the sergeant grabbed him and pulled him back down. You're not going out. You're not going anywhere. Stay right here. You'll be killed. And he waited for the sergeant to look the other way, and he took out, off out of that trench to go get his brother. Well, he found him, and he was badly, badly wounded, but uh, he picked him up, carried him back, and made his way into the trench. Of course, he was shot then on the way back. This is a true story. 
And when he got back, the sergeant said to him, what a waste, you, you, you've been a fool. He, he, he would never have made it, and now you won't make it either. And he said, no, 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 sergeant. He said, no, no. And his, his last words, he said this. He said, you know what he said when I got there? He said, what did he say? He said, I knew you'd come. That's brotherhood, y'all. And that is really, really, really hard to find. But it shouldn't be because it's commanded in the word of God. Not that you would like it. Not that you would show an interest in it. Not that you would include it in your portfolio of things to consider when you get some time. But that you would so prioritize it that it could be said about John, that it could be said about Bill, that it could be said about Mike, that it could be said about Tyler. He loves the brotherhood. He loves our thing. He loves what we have. And he works on it. And he gives himself to it. And he protects it. Thank God for Pastor Ryan. Do you have any idea the amount of vision that is being expressed to try to rally a rag tag? <laughs> um, I'm looking at you. You say, well, yeah, we're looking at you too, bro. I know, I know, I know. I'm not saying I don't fit. I'm just saying we're not awesome. turn to somebody and say it's true we're not that awesome really <laughs> you speak for yourself man I'm not speaking for myself I'm speaking from us for us we're a brotherhood and we have a thing and how awesome to be under a leadership that wants to rally us and gather us and inspire us to those ends God's provision for your success as a man is 1 Peter 2, 17b, say it. God's provision for your success over temptation. God's provision for your success as a provider. God's provision for your family to win. Your success wall to wall as a Christian comes to this. This, this brotherhood. This brotherhood, not the man. We all fall in many ways. We all disappoint one another. It's not the man that I'm holding up. It's the system. The system of brotherhood. Our thing. Us together more by far than we could ever be separately. Note this. Christianity is not a solo sport. Christianity is not a solo sport like bowling. Are, are you a bowler? Yeah, I go, I work on my game here. I'm a bowler. I'm a golfer. Same thing. That's so weak. That's so weak. People who watch golf like to sleep. <laughs> True or false? Did I come here? To, I came here to speak truth to you. People. No, no, man. Come on. Football. We're a team. Basketball, baseball, men's gym, no. <laughs> Isn't it true that the best moments of life are those moments, if you've ever been on a team that was a winning team? You were winning. Aren't those like the greatest moments of life? But this is our team. This is our team. And we're supposed to be winning. And we are winning. And we can win. Amen. So there it is, God's word commanding you. 1 Peter 2, 17b, say it. Men in Christ, devoted to him and devoted to our thing, to one another. So I moved into this RV park. It's kind of like going back to high school. And because you're all just like locked in there together, you know. And, and so I just sort of was feeling it out. Within the first few days, there was this guy... I'll call him Keith because that's not his real name. There was this guy, Keith, and, um, man, everybody was just down on this guy. And, you know, they didn't like the way that he talked to the women. He's a single guy, and he'd just been through a divorce, and he drank too much, and he was loud, and la, la, la. And one time he had to have the police called on him. And 
I don't know, there's just, there's just something in me, and it's partly because of some of the things that I've been through that I hope I'll have a chance to tell you about sometime, but I was just like, I'm not okay with this. And so I just kind of made this guy my little project. And I just started telling everybody, anybody says anything against Keith, you're going to have to deal with me. <laughs> and uh, so I was over at that pickleball court, and... And somebody says to me, you know, why was the police over at Keith's house the other night? I said, I, that's for sure none of your business. He said, well, it just seems to me. I said, stop. He said, well, I've just, you know, as, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you're not concerned at all. This has nothing to do with you. You should shut your mouth. There may have been some other words in there that I'm going to save. But he didn't get it. And I finally had to say, you need to back up now! And everyone stopped playing pickleball. <laughs> and everyone that asked me what's going on, I said, this guy is so broken, they were afraid he was going to kill himself in December. Anyone says a word against this guy, this is a problem for me, and you need to know that now. And if that's a problem for you, then let's go. <laughs> See, sometimes you just have to come to the place in your life and say, I'm not backing up anymore. I can't back up anymore. And where we can't back up is this territory called brotherhood. Learn this phrase. If you have a pen, write it down. If you put notes in your phone, write this phrase down. It's the first time I've said it. I'm as serious as a heart attack right now. Write this phrase down. I don't have ears for that. Well, you know, I was just, I was watching Jamie the other day. I was watching Andy the other day. I was watching Pastor Ryan. What? I don't have ears for that. I stand here as a man who made some mistakes and um, suffered um, a ton of betrayal and thought for a good while I would never even go back to church again. It's hard for me to stand up and talk about brotherhood because I want to just publicly confess my disappointment with it. But we get our eyes back on the Lord and we remember that none of us is perfect and all of us is being perfected in Christ and we don't let our heart get bitter because nobody wants to be that angry old guy, right? right? Nobody wants to be that guy. So you just give what you don't understand to the Lord and you try to get back to work serving the Lord and you believe afresh that God is wanting to do something from those things. All of that comes under this heading. I may not have said it. Brotherhood matters. Now, if just for the time that remains, you could buzz with me back to Genesis chapter 4. I want to say just a second thing. Brotherhood matters. And then please note this. Brotherhood is under attack. Brotherhood is under attack. And um, Pastor Ryan did such a great job on uh, the Lord's Day, taking us through Genesis chapter 3 and showing us about how the first sin was the fall of man. Uh, but now Genesis 4, the second sin, is the fall of brotherhood. Note this. Now, I'm on Genesis 4, 1. You tracking? Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I've gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Because women are always trying to spiritualize sex. <laughs> verse 2. Verse 2. And again, because once you do it once, and again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain, a worker of the ground. There is a three-part satanic strategy to neutralize brotherhood. Forget about the world, forget about the country, forget about the state of Arizona, forget about the city of Phoenix and surrounding cities. There is a three-part satanic strategy to neutralize brotherhood in Generation Church. It's the same card he's playing everywhere and always has. Because, take a moment right here and just think of the potential 
of a unified brotherhood in this church where every man lived free from the judgment of another man and was always loved and prayed for through whatever he went through. And, we, and we're for one another the way that God is for us. Here right now in this room, begin to dream a dream of brotherhood like it's not found anywhere. Amen. Not, not just to work at it, but to have it and to grow it and to love it. To keep that from happening, Satan starts with this. There's three words. Here's the first one, disguise. Disguise. Notice in the text... Again from verse 2, and again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel is the keeper of the sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, that's how it always happens, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Now the word of God is perfect. Say it's perfect. But when I read that, it makes me think, come on, God, can't you take them both? So there's something implied here. We are not nearly as entrenched in the sacrificial system as the Jewish people were, true or false? True. They uh, would have understood, and we can understand, there's no chance that Abel stumbled upon blood sacrifice as the proper way to cover your sin as you approach a holy God. It wasn't like he got lucky. You know what I'm saying? They had both been instructed. In fact, grain offerings had a place, just not as a provision for sin. And God was kind of fussy about it because, you know, later on, his son was going to come about whom they would say, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He didn't want that to be, behold, the celery stalk that takes away the sin of the world. You track it with me? This was a fairly important point. Someone say check. Yeah. All right. So if we understand that that must have been understood, Cain was jealous. Cain was jealous of Abel. And the Bible goes out of its way to say, I mean, these guys weren't that different, right? I mean, they were both, <laughs> they were both farmers. They, they both had dirt under their fingernails. They both wore Overalls, they both had goofy plaid shirts with dirty hats that should have been replaced a while ago. They were farmers, okay? Oh, one's tilling the ground, one's milking the cows. Is it really, really that different? How they could have found a brotherhood. Same parents, same profession. But instead, this is real important, y'all. Instead, because of their ego, they had to let the differences between them become everything. And that is what Satan is doing to brotherhood. He's causing us to think that little differences are a thing when they're not a thing. And how he dresses and how he looks and what he drives and where he works and how he acts. Man, get off your high horse. Get off of it. You're ruining brotherhood. Notice this, if you think a thing is a thing that isn't a thing, you're Satan's thing to destroy brotherhood. Because you do that. Look at, I can't believe he's wearing stonewashed jeans, man. Holy 1990s, Batman. <laughs> Look at that guy's car, man. Who does he think he is? Look at that guy's beard. Hey, back off. Disguise. Fact, Cain and Abel could have, or to say it better, this did not have to be a thing. Learn to say this at your table, in your group, with your brothers, especially these dear, precious brothers that we love and we love our thing. Learn to say, that's not a thing, y'all. That's not a thing. That don't need to be a thing. How many people would agree they didn't have to have a thing about the sacrifice? Here, take some of my animal sacrifice. Let's go together. Everybody say it didn't have to be a thing. Yes. Satan is a liar. That's the thing. 
Look at those tattoos. I think this is this isn't should be. I think this isn't. And shut up, man. <laughs> Just shut up. You don't love the brotherhood, and we're all working on that. Proverbs eighteen nineteen says, "An offended brother is harder to win than a fortified city." Offense is pride taken root. So first, disguise. He makes us think it's a thing that isn't a thing. I mean, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen says that he's an angel of light, right? So disguise, and then divide, divide. Back to the Genesis passage. The Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry? Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? You could have that. You could do that. You could... Come on. This is a really fair system. And if you do not do well, every man's worst verse, Genesis 4, 7. If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the, at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Could I just share your testimony? Sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Like, frick, it's so strong. Somebody say, sin's strong. That's why we need the brotherhood. The brotherhood is God's provision for victory over what we cannot face on our own. Sometimes I don't love the truth enough to do the right thing on my own. Sometimes I don't love the word of God enough to stay in it on my own. Sometimes I don't love the church enough to make sure I'm here every week without my brother saying to me, hey bro, where were you man? Come on, I'll save you a seat next time. That's what the brotherhood does. But the wedge was in Cain so deeply, nothing was going to change it. Verse 8, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. We don't get, <laughs> anyone want to try to imagine that conversation for a minute? Can you kind of imagine that? Because in about 40 seconds, he's going to be killing him. So on a scale of 1 to 10, where would you rate the animosity? The Bible doesn't even tell us what they said. We can kind of get it. Cain spoke to his brother Abel, period. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. God was trying to get Cain to soften his heart, but Cain was hardening his heart against God and against his brother. Any brother with a hardened heart against his brother has a heart that is hard to God. Stop pretending that you can have a great thing like this with an awful thing like this. God loves your brother. So this is what happens. Make a note of it. Brotherhood gets murdered by a man, Cain, who would rather stop his brother's heart from beating than soften his own heart. Isn't that what happened? Wow, is right. The Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? That must have been something, right? Like, I, I, I met a few of you guys. I find you guys pretty impressive. And this brother came over to me tonight. Where's Dayton? Is he there? He comes over and meets me. I was like, that's, that's an impressive guy. And, and, but no offense. Imagine how much higher that would be if God was talking to you. Like, read this like it's there, y'all. God said... To Cain, where's your brother? If God said to you, where's your brother? I'd be searching the Rolodex fast. Let me get you his number right now. Instead, he has the hard-hearted audacity to say, what? I don't know. I don't know. Was that true or was that false? So he lies in God's face because he didn't understand God. There's a whole big sermon there. We lie to God because we don't really understand his nature. Why would you ever lie to God? But he says to God, I don't know. But then he says, he doesn't just lie to God, he blames God. He says, do you see it in the text? He said, am I my brother's keeper? And the last time I checked, this is not a my job description. <laughs> I'm trying to do everything you want me to do, God. I thought I was going to get a pretty positive review here. But now you bring up something you ever even told me I was supposed to be taken care of. This is the murderer talking. The audacity. 
You've never been in a fight till you've been in a fight with a guy who thinks that God's on his side. And that's this guy. Destroying brotherhood. What a message in the second chapter of God's word. So the last word in my time's gone. Disguise, divide, destroy. Maybe I'll teach you about that another time. I'll just say that Satan wants to get men alone. Look at this list of men in the Bible that God alone. Just look at this picture. There they are. Worst thing happened to Adam, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Samson, Jonah, Elijah, P Peter, Jesus Christ. Get him alone. Get him alone. Get him alone. The satanic strategy for victory over you is disguise. Make you think a thing is a thing that isn't a thing. So you pull back. I don't need that. I don't want that. I'm not for that. I'm not there. Not me. Don't have to. Not again. Not again. Disguise. Divide. Get the man by himself. And when Satan can get a man by himself, the destruction begins. Your darkest places are your secret places. And brotherhood is a loving light into all of those corners where life transformation happens and God's glory flourishes. What is the answer to the question, am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes. Stand up for a second, would you? And would you do this, even if it's just a wee bit uncomfortable? Would you get close to at least to one other man? Would you put your hand on his shoulder? I don't want you to hug him, but that wouldn't be wrong. But I want you to put your hand on his shoulder like that. That's perfect. And, Pastor, can I pray for the brotherhood? And can I say our church? I'm blessed to be a little part of this church and, and getting some healing done in my heart. Thank you for that. Now, Father, I pray the Generation Church for your glory, for your glory, Lord, so that the fame of your name would spread. I pray that you would take us further and more deeply into brotherhood than we ever thought was even possible. Give us fresh eyes to see past the hurt that we have felt. Let us put forgiveness where woundedness has been. And let your healing be our experience. And let us be for one another all that you have created us to be. I don't have to walk alone. I don't have to stand alone. I don't have to do this alone. I have my brothers. And so my brotherhood flourish here, we pray for the glory of God. Let the lonely man find the comfort of his brothers. Let the defeated man receive the assurance of God's forgiveness from his brothers. Let the rebellious man fall under the weight of the pressure of brotherhood and submit afresh to the Holy Spirit, to the glory of God. And in the days ahead, and on these nights that the pastor is leading us to come together, let this be a true beginning. Let this be a real refreshing start. And give us faith to believe that here and now we can be all that you call for in 1 Peter 2, 17b. Amen.